Well, this is a great uh, time of year and great moment, I think, in history for us to come to this passage uh, because as we celebrate uh, graduations, as we gather together with friends, as we perhaps reacquaint ourselves with friends that we've not been able to be with as often over the previous year, this passage calls us into mission. Uh, This is a right moment for the Holy Spirit to recalibrate our courage as witnesses for Jesus. That's really what this section of verses is about. Now, just to set the stage, John chapters 14 to 17, Jesus is talking to uh, the room of men who will be his apostles, who will go out into the world. uh, And uh, this is an emotionally turbulent time for them. Some verses previously were told that Jesus looked at them and he saw that uh, their hearts, their spirits were kind of stirred up the way that the surface of a lake would be stirred up with a storm coming across. They're turbulent because their teacher, their master, their leader, the one who they are coming to understand is the Son of God in a unique way, uh, the Messiah in a unique way, is leaving them. And this is a tense moment for them. It's actually a joyful moment for Jesus. At one point, he chides them for not entering into his joy. It doesn't mean that all that is ahead of him is warm and fuzzy. In fact, some that is ahead of him is dark and sad. Uh, indeed, is betrayal and arrest and crucifixion. But, uh, but on the whole, it's a joyful moment because this is the moment when Jesus will complete his mission, uh, a mission which has been programmed not just over the intervening three decades, of his incarnate life, uh, but the mission which has been anticipated from eternity past, when he will come into history as the Son of God and will complete the saving work for the people of God. And this is a, a moment of joy, and Jesus needs to prepare these men for their mission, which they will undertake as he returns to be with the Heavenly Father. Jesus has promised to send the Holy Spirit to the church as the church goes out into the world. And it is worth noting, especially if you're just catching this sermon series in progress and haven't been with us previously, that the gospel writer John uses the word world very often in a unique kind of way, not describing principally the planet on which you and I dwell, this earth that's moving throughout the solar system, but rather the kind of the spiritual system, the world, which is aligned against God and his purposes. So he uses it to describe kind of the world system that is in rebellion against God. The world is not a neutral place spiritually. The world is our natural habitat, not just the the planet, but the spiritual realm. And God has supernaturally saved us out of that spiritual realm and into his family, into the church. And Jesus is describing this uh, to the men in chapter 15, verse 15, which uh, Pastor Aldrink described for us last week. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. And then Jesus commissions his friends to go out into the world. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. So this is a commission of the disciples that they would go out into this world. And the irony is that the world both desperately needs them to undertake this mission and will be deeply hostile to them. And the disciples need to understand this, that the environment for their mission will be hostile. Verse 18, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. And what Jesus needs from these men in that room at that moment in time is he needs for them to be brave. He needs for them to go out into the world to carry the gospel message to a world that's desperately needy and desperately hostile to the message. And Jesus' lesson remains relevant for us today. We're not apostles in the same sense that 
uh, that John and Peter and James were, but every Christian is connected to Christ. We are uh, connected to the vine as the previous part of chapter 15 describes us, and so we share in the task of making Jesus known. Every Christian is saved out of a hostile environment to play a role in carrying the mission of the gospel back into that hostile environment. And so Jesus' words are timely for us on the verge of summer 2021. And I want, you to, I want you to think about four things. You get a bonus thing. I told the first service to think about three things, but you get a bonus thing. And here is the, the bonus thing. I want you to think about one person in your life who is not a Christian that you uh, sense a call to share the gospel with. I want you to bring that person to mind. And then I want to ask you uh, the same questions that I've been asking myself. Uh, what hinders being a brave witness to that person. Do you ever find yourself less than brave when it comes time to share the gospel? I do. And here are, here are three things that, uh, that can dampen bravery when it comes to gospel witness. First of all, I mean, there are some people, uh, and this is just an observation, not a condemnation. There are some people who thrive on conflict. Have you met a person like that? Some people thrive on conflict. Most of us don't love hostility. And we think, well, if I share the gospel with someone, I might encounter some hostility. That can dampen bravery. Secondly, we can feel inadequate as witnesses. I mean, well, I, I, you know, I, I'm not a sterling example of the Christian life. If anybody knew the way that I really was, they'd say, man, you, you, you definitely need Jesus. You may not be the best ambassador for Jesus. Uh, you're, uh, you're inadequate in that way. Or you might think, well, I, I don't know enough, or I, I don't know enough to have the right answers to the follow-up questions. I feel inadequate. Or thirdly, uh, we fear being marginalized. I think this is an increasingly a fear. We fear being known as one of them, a Christian. And we think that if I'm known as one of them, a Christian, then this will mean fewer invites to parties, fewer real conversations uh, if we witness for Jesus. Three obstacles to bravery. And Jesus addresses all of them in this passage of Scripture. So think about your friend that you want to share the gospel with. Think about what can impede your witness to them, just the fear in your own heart. And let's see how Jesus addresses all three of these obstacles as we go out into this summer uh, with mission opportunities. So first, mission confidence and the fear of hostility. John 15, 18. If the world hates you, Know that it has hated me before it hated you. Jesus teaches us that hostility is not personal. Hostility to the gospel is not personal, but it is predictable. It's predictable. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things uh, they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. So from the, the very first room full of Christians in Jerusalem in advance of Good Friday down to today, intimate association with Jesus is provocative to the world. Now, this might be obvious to you, uh, but this was not explained to me when I was a young Christian. Uh, it was explained to me that I should witness. It was explained to me that I should tell my friends about Jesus. What was less explained to me was that this was not going to be universally well-received, that, uh, that I wasn't just going to show up and talk to my friends who weren't Christians, and they'd be like, oh, I'm so glad that you mentioned all of these things to me. It's been delightful. Thank you for witnessing to me. Uh, it, it's, we've just had a great time. It, it, it almost never went that way way. But the applications really write themselves in this section as we think about hostility, as Jesus introduces this concept. And here are really three applications. First of all, humility. No Christian 
Not me, not you, not the apostle Peter. No Christian is a Christian because we are in any way superior to anyone else. Jesus is very explicit about this. He says that he chose us out of the world, which means that the world is our natural habitation. And listen to just a few of the ways that the world, and remember, not the planet, but the world system that is aligned against God and his purposes uh, from the fall onward, uh, is described in the Gospel of John. First of all, citizens of the world love darkness rather than light because our works are evil. The world's works are evil, John 7. The world which is dark and needs Christ's light, the world, that world is judged and needs saved from judgment, John 12. The world system is ruled by the evil one, John 14. The world is the place where the disciples will have tribulation and the world has been overcome by Jesus, John 16. Praise the Lord. But Jesus, to the disciples and to the churches, our posture in the world is one of humility, that we've been saved out of that, that that was our natural home, and that we are saved out of that as a function of God's grace. And Jesus tells the apostles, and I think the same is is true for us, is that uh, we should secondly expect hostility. You think, well, this is not an encouraging message. But Jesus is preparing these men for the most important job in the world, which you have a share in. The, the most important job in the world is helping someone in the world know that they don't have to stay in the world, that they can have a Savior, that the Savior has come, that they are saved out of that. Jesus says, expect hostility. Verse 20, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. I I think this helps us be savvy in in the moment that we live in, but really in, in every moment that the church lives in, in every place. So I'm very much for freedom of religion. I'm very much for uh, our society being a place of of genuine religious pluralism. I think that our society flourishes uh, when that kind of toleration happens. I am for legal means that protect religious freedom. But we should not be surprised when Christians don't experience the same kind of toleration. It shouldn't be surprising to us in our culture or in any culture around the world And it shouldn't be surprising because Jesus has already explained why it is this way earlier in John's gospel. He gives this explanation, third application, in John chapter 3, verses 16 to 21. You can look over there. I don't think I put all of the verses up on the screen, but I trust that you have a Bible near you and you can look them up. So we love John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Praise the Lord. That's a great verse. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So so God the Father sends God the Son into the world on this holy rescue mission. The world rejects the Son, thereby also rejecting the Father and the Father's offer of salvation. Why does the world do this? Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, praise the Lord. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. It's a very important piece of information that that the world loves being the world. And the world loves doing worldly things. It's not your fault. The, the world doesn't celebrate naturally when a Christian shows up and says, hey, I, I just wanted to share with you the most amazing news. The most amazing news is that you and I have this problem called sin and it separates us from God and that God provided a, a single solution for every person, uh, the Lord Jesus who came and he took the penalty for my sin so that I could be forgiven and so that I could walk after him. Uh, and, and that's great news. And the world's like, I'm not sure that is great news because I kind of like doing what I'm doing.
Jesus has yet to go into the world to tell people about this because people are desperate to know this. Whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried on in God. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection call the world's bluff. The, the world, the system in rebellion against God is, is muddling along. Nothing to see here. Life is good. No problems. What's the, the line from the Lion King? Akuna? Well, I can never get it right. I don't want to say a bad word on this. is going out to the whole world. Um, <laughs> don't worry. Be happy. And Jesus comes and he stands in the middle of history and he says, worry. Because this will all be accounted for. And you can know the outcome of the accounting now as it relates to the future. Forgiven or not forgiven. That's what we have to tell. So no wonder it's offensive. It doesn't mean we have to be offensive in how we share it. That's a different problem. But Jesus says to the men in the room, all these things they will do to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. So hostility, we approach it with humility, with expectation. We understand the explanation, but we can feel inadequate in the face of it. Mission confidence uh, and the fear of inadequacy. We fear. Have you ever felt this fear about sharing the gospel that you're going to share the gospel with someone and you're just going to blow it in such a huge way? I mean, it's just going to be disaster. Um, you'd be teaching some kind of heresy. And I mean, the worst outcome might be that they would believe the heresy that you're teaching. And you're like, I'm just not adequate for this. You know, I'm, I'm good for like one follow-up question. But if they ask a second follow-up question, I'm going to be phoning a friend. And I don't have many friends. And so I'm just not going to be doing this. And, uh, and you're just worried about mission failure. And there's helpful books, and you went to the seminar, but you forgot the seminar, and someone stole your notebook, and you haven't reviewed it for a while, and you're just not confident at all. Well, in verses 22 to 27, Jesus gives a different answer to the fear of inadequacy. He teaches us that the root of gospel rejection is not inferior information, but intractable pride. Pride is the root of gospel rejection, and he reminds his disciples and us of this. I mean, the generation that Jesus ministered among, think about it, those men and women and girls and boys uh, who lived in Galilee or who lived in Judea, and Jesus came into their town, and their friend was blind, and then Jesus healed them, and then he could see, and they heard Jesus give a sermon, and they listened to the sermon, and they, they heard the message, and they saw the miracles. They had amazing access to information. They had direct access to the Word of God, walking and doing miracles among them. Jesus says in verse 22, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. And uh, it's worth clarifying as the commentators do. He doesn't mean so much sin generally as much as the sin of rejecting the gospel. Whoever hates me hates my father also. They saw Jesus do miracles that confirmed his identity as God's unique son. They saw Jesus do miracles that uh, mapped onto Old Testament teachings that revealed that he was the Messiah who'd been promised. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. Jesus invited no cause for their hatred. He didn't do any hateful thing, and yet they hated him. The people who heard him teach and saw the miracles rejected the gospel. Why? Well, look at verse 25 and look how Jesus describes their response. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. Their law. It's a curious way that Jesus puts it because uh, it, it is, of course, God's law, the Old Testament scripture. It is, of course, God's word. Why does Jesus put it this way? Well, I think he puts it this way because he is identifying kind of their grasping, gripping onto their worldview that they wouldn't let Jesus challenge. They wouldn't let Jesus challenge 
their way of thinking about the Old Testament. As he showed that the Old Testament pointed to their need for a Savior, as they showed uh, the need of the King to come, as he showed from Isaiah the need for the King to come and die, as he showed them all of these things in God's script, they're like, well, that's not the way we read our law. That's pride. That's pride. That's why people reject the gospel. Not because of an information deficit, but because of pride. So where uh, in this kind of world where every human here is naturally prideful is our hope for adequacy. Well, it's in the supernatural witness that God provides. Here on Pentecost Sunday, we've been thinking a lot about the Holy Spirit. Verse 26, but when the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. In other words, the Holy Spirit will come into this world where pride is an issue, is the issue, and he will come and he will bear witness to me. And the one who bears witness to me, the Holy Spirit, he is the changer of hearts. As Jesus had told Nicodemus, the theologian in chapter 3, he is the one who comes and who gives new life to dead people. So he is completely adequate as a supernatural uh, a supernatural witness witness to convert people. Conversion is not an information problem. Conversion requires the work of the Holy Spirit, which the Holy Spirit is completely capable of doing. That's good news. And if you need any evidence that the Holy Spirit is still doing that, if you're sitting next to a Christian, you're sitting next to the evidence. The Holy Spirit is still at work doing that. And the apostles too will bear witness. Verse 27, you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning, which is where we come in. The Holy Spirit still working today. The Holy Spirit still working through the witness of the church today. But the primary application for us is a little bit different, I think, because the Holy Spirit came and bore witness and the disciples who were with Jesus bore witness. And then the Holy Spirit inspired those disciples who lived with Jesus to write it down to put it in a book. He inspired it so that we could have it. So that when we sit down to witness to someone, the adequacy is in the scripture, right? That, uh, that all, you, all you need to do really is to sit down and talk about the Bible with someone and allow the Holy Spirit to work. We can do that. We have the fear-crushing adequate witness to the truth of the gospel in Holy Scripture. Which means that we can be free from trying to over-engineer how we share the gospel. I, I don't know if you ever do this, but I do this. Did you ever find that like you're trying to over-engineer how you share the gospel? Like, well, if I come up with the right anecdote and I tell the right self-effacing story, you know, the latest dumb thing that I did, and I make them laugh, and they laugh, and I've got a lot of those, and I share the gospel with, that was a joke, I, but I do, and that was one, and now you're back with me, and I share the thing, and they laugh, and now we've got a rapport, and now I start sharing the gospel, then they'll be really happy to hear about the fact that they have a sin problem and need a savior. It doesn't work that way, right? I mean, usually it doesn't work that way. We, we try to over-engineer sharing. Jesus is like, just share, just share, and trust the Holy Spirit to work. He's going to be the one who's calling every person, man, woman, boy, girl, to faith at the right moment, at the right time, and he might use you. So just share the gospel. Use your Bible. Yeah, but if I do that, people might not like me. This is where the fear of marginalization comes in. I think this is an increasing fear uh, for us, that if we share the gospel, we're going to be rejected by friends. This is certainly true uh, in, in my experience as, uh, as I've shared the gospel with people who are friends who have decided to not be friends anymore, and that's okay. I don't say that as a martyr. I just say that as, as a reality. I have a, a, a friend who overcame this fear of marginalization and invited some other friends to hear about the gospel and to, at a meeting, and the meeting didn't go exactly the way that my friend imagined. And my friend's response was brilliant. Uh, my friend said, I just don't want my friends to think that Jesus is strange. She'd taken herself out of the equation. Sometimes 
the greatest obstacle to mission confidence are our social fears. If you find this in your heart, you're not alone. The first apostles surely felt it too. That's why Jesus addresses it head on at the beginning of chapter 16. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Now, this is a, a big deal to them that might seem like less a big deal to us, but uh, you know, it wasn't so much that if you lived in a little town in Israel that you had your choice among many different synagogues to go to. You know, this synagogue had more of a liturgical feel, and this synagogue had kind of more of a, they had a smoke machine when the guy got up to talk, and, and they had the more upbeat music, and they used a different translation. It, it wasn't like that. There was one synagogue, and you went there, and it was where you went for worship and learning, but it was also your social network. And that's why it's such a big deal throughout the Gospel of John that we've met people who, uh, who were so afraid of being put out of the synagogue. Remember the parents of the man who was born blind who was healed, and they, they come, and they're willing to throw their own son under the bus rather than be associated with Jesus because they're afraid of being put out of the synagogue. And some of the religious elite were very interested in following Jesus, but they were afraid of the Pharisees, and they were afraid of losing their place in the synagogue. It's about their social network. And Jesus tells the guys in the room, he's like, they're going to put you out of the synagogue. And, and he doesn't like sugarcoat it after that. He's like, they're going to put you out of the synagogue. Next topic. This is very encouraging. Why does he tell them this in advance? Because he wants them to be brave. Because the people who are going to put them out of the synagogue are in desperate need of the message that they're going to bring. They're absolutely dependent upon them to bring the gospel message to them. And so he tells them to be expectant and brave in the face of it. And then, secondly, uh, to be brave in the face of religious marginalization. One of the ironies of the gospel, see if you can track with me on this. I'm going to need some head nods. One of the ironies of the gospel is it makes religious people mad. One of the ironies of the gospel is it makes religious people mad. What do you mean? I thought Christianity was a religion. In one sense, yes, but think about it this way. Religions generally describe human efforts to build a relationship to a God. I do this religious thing. I do this religious ritual. I do this religious activity. I have this religious experience. I identify with this religious thing. I keep this religious calendar. I undertake these religious activities. And I do these things to build my relationship with God. I try to climb a religious ladder to my God. That is the path of religion. And Jesus has come and he's turned that upside down. We've heard him say over and over, today passage and throughout the gospel that no person can through personal effort fabricate a relationship with God. He does not describe, describe humanity's condition as one of spiritual illness. He describes humanity's condition as one of spiritual death. He doesn't say you need a restart. He says you need a rebirth. Why do you need a rebirth? Because you're really dead. And that's offensive to people who are trying to earn their way to God. Jesus says that faith in him, according to the gospel, that he is crucified for our sin, that he's raised for our deliverance, that he reigns from heaven today, and that he rules over history, and that faith in this by grace alone brings us into a relationship with God is the only way to have a relationship with God. That's offensive to people. All of which Jesus says is necessary for these men to understand. Listen to this. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering a service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you. When their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Jesus wants us to be brave witnesses when religious people marginalize Christians. I could tell you a hundred stories about this. Sitting in a, a high-walled 
wood paneled commons room of an Ivy League divinity school at, at a summer seminar. And we're, we're having lunch and we're sitting at the tables and they've given us the box lunch and we're doing what you do with the box lunch. You're seeing how the lottery went for you and you're hoping it's ham, but you probably got turkey, but you can at least trade, you, you do this right. You, you can trade out the chips with the person sitting next to you and you're, you're, you're trading chips and you're trying to trade up and you've got the chips. It's almost lunchtime and, and things are going and you're sitting at this table with a room of, of clergy from a diverse religious background, and they've all got on the religious garb of their background, and I have on the religious garb of the PCA, which is exactly what I'm wearing today, golf shirt and pants, and we're introducing ourselves, and they've got fantastic titles, and I don't, I mean, I, my title's fine. You can call me Dave, and they're going around, and they're saying, well, where do you serve? And I've, at the first whatever, of whatever and at the second whatever of whatever. And isn't it great that we're all clergy and we're having chips together and we're having the chips and they, they come to me and they're like, well, what about you? Well, I, I'm a Presbyterian pastor. Oh, that's delightful. A Presbyterian pastor. I had an uncle who had a cousin who had a neighbor who was married to a guy who knew a Presbyterian pastor. And that was great. And they seem like lovely people. And, you know, where, where do you serve? Certainly you serve in the mainline denomination. open the chip bag. <laughs> and you're like, well, no. And they're like, well, well you're not one of those PCA boys, are you? <laughs> yeah, one of those Bible-believing guys? One of those Jesus is the only way guys? Because some of us around the table have, have got a different way. And we're working hard at our different way. And we don't like this is a really good way to end up having lunch by yourself for the rest of the week, which is not a bad thing, really. <laughs> you should try having lunch by yourself. That's how I spent middle school. It's just fine. <laughs> Jesus says, be ready for marginalization. But what's his remedy? His remedy is not just to toughen up not just to resolve to be disliked, not just to embrace the pain, it's to remember the community, the community that you do belong to. That's the secret of verse 3, isn't it? Through Christ's work and the Spirit's uniting us to Christ that, that we're put into the vine, to use the metaphor of the up part of the chapter, we know the Father and the Son. Jesus wants us to be bold in remembering that. You, if you're a Christian, you know the Father you know the Son, that by grace alone you have been brought into the family of heaven, that there is a community that you belong to. There is a community in which you are not marginalized. The community in which you belong to is a community in which actually the Son was marginalized at the cross for you so that you could be not marginalized, so that you could be brought in. You're, you're doubly rescued, that, that you belong in the family of heaven and you're rescued from the world. You're doubly rescued, and you get to play a role in the rescue of other people. I've been thinking about a story that came out just before Christmas last year in this regard. You know, you probably didn't read it, but it's the story of, of Eli from Tennessee. Eli is a seven-year-old foster child, and Eli is living with the uh, Davidson family, who at that point in time had fostered 34 children. And Eli was one of them. And sadly, their house caught on fire. And the, the Davidsons, uh, I have their names here, Chris and Nicole, were former firefighters. They were able to get two of the children out, Eli and another, but their 22-year-old uh, daughter, Erin, they were not able to get out. And so they're outside of the house, and the firefighter, Chris, is looking at the house, and he's got... Eli, the foster child, with him, and he takes the decision to put Eli through the window to go in and get Aaron. And Eli goes in through the window, and this is what he said in the news report. He said, I thought I couldn't do it, but then I said, I got her, Dad. I was scared, but I didn't want my sister to die. And Eli got Aaron to the window, and he hands her out, and he comes out. I was thinking, it's really a double rescue, isn't it? That 
Eli's rescued from whatever circumstance made foster care the right decision for him to be brought up. And he's been rescued into this family. He's been rescued into this family to then become a rescuer. So that now, as a member of this family, he goes and he rescues someone who couldn't rescue himself. I think that's really our call. That's really our mission, that, that we've been rescued and brought into our family. And it's like Jesus says, look, you, you've been brought into my family, and I love you, and I accept you, and I welcome you, and I suffer over you, but now you have to go through the window into the fire to rescue someone else. And I'll go with you by my Holy Spirit. And we'll go rescue people. And we're actually going to rescue all the people who need to be rescued. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does, is He makes sure that none of Jesus' people are lost. And you and I just get to play a role in that. Jesus says, be brave. Don't worry about the hostility. Don't worry about the adequacy. Don't worry about the marginalization. I will help you be brave. So bring to mind that, that person from the beginning of the sermon that I asked you to think about, who you want to share with. What's going to get in your way? What's going to get in my way? Nothing has to get in our way. The Spirit will go with us.